He is part of my team, but he also owns his own business, Extra Mile Technologies. Hey, I got the name right. Um, and is one of my Windows guys. I rely on him for a lot of Windows work. Uh, he's gonna be sharing some enterprise deployment stuff. If you have any questions after the session, like you don't wanna ask ahead of time, Mike will be around for the next two days, so you've got a lot of time to ask him questions. Um, if you want copies of the presentation, just let Jenny know out at the reception table and she'll take down names and what sessions you wanted. We will email things out to you later on, but they will also, once the videos go up, we will make them available with the videos. So if you have anything that you do want that you ha don't have, just let us know. All right, thank you, Danielle. Am I, am I good, Art? The mic's good? Okay, all right, good. <laughs> So uh, what we're going to talk about now is uh, WPA2 Enterprise. Maybe some of you have seen that as an option and you wondered what it was, or uh, maybe you were wondering, how do I put an SSID out to all of my clients without a password that they can then look at on their company-issued device and then put into their personal device and uh, get on the company Wi-Fi? And kind of thing. So uh, before we talk about that, first we got to say, why Wi-Fi, right? Well, pretty much today's day and age, it's a necessity. It's, it's one of the essential things that everybody has to have. Um, I, I, used, I used this example once before and then somebody said, oh no, you forgot something. So now we've modified it. And uh, these guys at the table up front, they have it nailed. They have the Big brick o power that uh, yes you can you can see and and that's pretty much where we're at today. Uh, you've you've got to have Wi-Fi in your environment. Um, so in this session here, we're going to go over a whole bunch of different pieces that I used on a project to put this all together. Okay, and I'm not getting into the specifics of configuring every different device because your environment is going to, do, is going to be different. Uh, if, if you had a greenfield deployment, I wouldn't go out and buy these same pieces to do it. But this is what I used. Uh, so uh, Ubiquiti APs and a Unify controller, and then HP switches. Um, so love Ubiquiti stuff. Uh, HP switches, I like them a lot too. Uh, then on the configuration side, we needed a, a network policy server. It's the NPS role in Windows uh, Server 2012 R2, I think I, I used my example. Uh, group policy, you need that to uh, push this out unless you've got just one or two um, devices. And then in my case, I had a SonicWall router. I'm not as big a fan of uh, SonicWall now. Uh, as I, as I was, um, but that's what I had to work with. I used the, uh, let's see, the Sonic, or the Ubiquiti UAP ACs. So these are the ones that will uh, do like 1.3 gigabits per second. They've got two ports on them, so you can run two CAT 5E6 cables, whatever, to them. Did you ever? Did you actually test that? Last time I tried one, the second ports weren't active. Yeah, so I did, and I found out the fastest device that I had on my network was 450 megabits per second, so I couldn't, couldn't go beyond that. But I put them in because a good chunk of the cost of doing a project like this is the labor, and I was like, well, I'll put these up and they'll be up there for a few years. And, uh, you know, eventually we'll get laptops and whatever that have faster uh, NICs in them and, and then we'll be able to get those speeds. But it didn't make sense to put out cheaper ones. These, I think I bought the eight pack and I think I was at like $2,600 uh, for those access points. And if I just started to look at anything from the other uh, vendors that you'd typically go to, I was at 10, 12 grand any day of the week. So that's where Ubiquity really has it nailed. 
the other thing too, which is really cool about Ubiquity stuff is I could have put in some of the cheaper ones, or if I had some of the older ones, I could have used them, uh, you know, like put the ACs out on the production floor and then put the wireless G1 outside the bathroom. <laughs> You know, so you've got you've got the coverage and speed where you need it, I guess. Um, and uh, these things, they come with a, a gigabit or a gigabit. They come with a PoE plus adapter. Uh, it's important to note the plus because there's a little bit more power there on the plus side. And yeah, if you got if you're just rolling one or two of them, you can use their little brick. But if you've got like in this case, I had eight of them. Uh, then you, it's going to look a lot cleaner when you get a PoE switch. But when you get the PoE switch, you got to get the PoE plus switch, so you've got the extra power. Um, I was also rolling security cameras with this, some of the powered ones, and those ones, uh, they, some of them were outdoor ones, and they have heaters in them, which use a fair amount of power. So, um, so that's that's what I used. Uh, okay. Oh, this is a this is an eye chart <laughs> for for everyone. <laughs> I had to I had to zoom up myself to see what I was looking at. Um, on the Ubiquity stuff, a, a couple of tips. Uh, name your controller Ubiquity. Like, put a record in DNS for Ubiquity, and then when you get your access points out of the box and plug them in, they'll automatically try to associate and pull into the controller and then you can um, assign them. The other thing, because of what we're doing later, like in, in most cases you probably don't care if the IP address on the AP changes. Because of what we're doing with the NPS server, it needs to stay the same. So as soon as you get it in the controller, go into DHCP and add a reservation for the thing. Before you get started on placing the APs, download Ekahow or one of the other programs and do a survey. In my case, I had uh, Nortel access points was the was what was in place before this. And some of you are thinking, like, why Nortel? Well, a long time ago when Wi-Fi was, you know, just getting to the point where there was like commercial uh, use cases for it and that. We had a Nortel phone system and I was like, oh, you know what? Any day now there's going to be a Nortel Wi-Fi phone and I want to avoid the finger pointing that's going to happen. So I'm going to put in this Nortel controller, Nortel access points, and then I got my Nortel phone system and it's all just going to come together. Nortel went bankrupt before anything came together. Okay. So I was, I was left with a totally unsupported wireless system but it was rock solid. It was up till the day that I, I took it down. But it was like wireless G uh, speed. Um, so, uh, and, and one of the things that I, that I should have said before, like along the why Wi-Fi thing, if you don't put Wi-Fi into an organization, people are going to get creative, okay? And that's when they go to Staples and Walmart and get their own AP and bury it under a desk so the... Um, IT guy misses it on his walk around audit and stuff. And I've, I've seen that stuff happen in other places where I've come in and they've asked me to troubleshoot something and I'm looking for a network loop somewhere and I'm looking for an unmanaged hub and I find this Wi-Fi and yeah. So you've got you've to do it and you ought to have company owned devices on a secure, on, on your company land for access to everything they need and then give them some guest access and uh, maybe throttle that if you need to, but keep that keep their stuff off of your your network. So, in this case here, we've got the heat map up. This is a this picture is a little bit deceiving because we've got uh, in some parts of the building it's three stories, in some parts it's two. The big thing here was to walk around and figure out where it was really critical that the Wi-Fi signal was good and then where eh, it wasn't so important, but you needed coverage. And this was a really old building, so they had some stone walls two feet thick. Um, 
And those were obvious that like you knew that was just gonna kill the signal. The thing that I didn't count on is in one area, they said, oh, let's, let's take this big open space and carve out a little conference area. And they carved out their conference area by putting up some metal bookshelves. It crushed the signal that my old APs were putting out. So as soon as you walked into the conference room, your Wi-Fi signal went down to, to nothing. And that, that wasn't good. So as I placed these, I went around and like I said, did the survey before and after and, and made sure I had good coverage where I needed it. So the Ubiquiti controller, how many of you are running Ubiquiti stuff? Almost like everybody, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. So this should look really familiar to you. You've got the controller and you set up your SSID and in there, Gonna grab the wireless. Art said he left. I think Daniel ran off with a good mic. Okay. Yep. Okay. So in the controller, this is one of those things where I said, "Oh, you've probably seen this WPA Enterprise, but like, what's that about?" Well, here's the option here, and as soon as you check that, it enables the IP address, and then it expects you to put an IP address and the radius server password and, and all that. So that's the, that's the first thing of doing your enterprise thing. Now, my recommendation would be to set up an SSID that um, you've got on WPA, personal WPA2, uh, with a password, and put that on your guest VLAN, and like get that part up and running first so that you've, you've got that uh, going and you can see that your access points are, are working. And then come back and try to do the enterprise piece because there's a lot of uh, things that need to work in order for this to work. And it can be uh, tough troubleshooting it. I actually built it, got it to work, and then broke things to build the troubleshooting document. <laughs> Because I knew that day would come when something would break. And I'm going to point out a couple of those uh, caveats uh, as we go. So there's the Ubiquiti controller. Then the other piece was the HP switches. Now, I, I said that I, I liked HP stuff. I've got a rack full of them. For this project, I went out and I bought a 2530-24G PoE Plus switch. And like I said, I needed that extra power for some of the security cameras more for than the um, ubiquity stuff, but it's there. Something that uh, helps out, how many of you have ever like gone into a shop where they've got different VLANs carved up and it's just like one wall and you have no idea what ports are what and stuff? I was like, okay, how about we just use some different colored cables? You know, like cables are cheap. You go to mono price and you can buy a bunch of them cheap. Let's use different colors for the cameras and for the access points and, and stuff. So at this point, I didn't have the cameras installed, so there, you don't see the other cables, but I've got the orange ones that tell me, hey, this is a wireless AP. It's on a different VLAN and stuff. Okay. So now we're moving on to the Microsoft Windows Server 2012 and that NPS role. And just like anything else, you go to the add uh, roles and features and it's a role, not a feature. Check a box, click next, wait, finish, reboot, and you've got the NPS role installed. Then you have to go configure it. Like in the, in the role wizard, it tells you, hey, you've got this new service, you need to configure it. So there's like a, a couple of things that you need to, to do to configure it. The first thing is you've got to put all of your radius clients in. So right on down here. And remember before I said, hey, you need to make sure your APs aren't bouncing around on different IPs and stuff. This is why because you're putting them in there by IP. And you can, if you got a lot of APs to do, when you set up the first one, you can make it a template 
When you go to do the next one, you can say, use this template. The funny thing is, it doesn't let you modify the things you need to modify once you select a template. But you can select a template, then deselect the template, and it leaves all those values filled in. Go, go, yeah, go, go, Microsoft. So I'm just going to throw it out there. That's, that's how I found the quickest way to do one after another of all these things and get them all in there. Um, in the example here, I've got all the Ubiquiti stuff, and then the Sonic Walls, I was doing uh, VPNs and stuff with uh, Radius Authentication, so it was coming back here for that. Okay. Now, uh, after you move on from the Radius clients, <coughs> then you've got the um, connection request policy, and this is the easy one. This one, you just tell it, hey, I'm going to do secure wireless connections. It's one of the drop downs. And um, you select the NAS port type as wireless. And that's the only condition of the policy. So nothing tricky there. All right, that's not my laptop. That's another laptop that I keep hearing ding in the background. I don't know if you can kill that, but OK. Uh, so the next one under network policies, this is the one where the uh, real work gets done. So on the first tab, you say, OK, I'm going to enable this policy. And this is a grant access policy. You can have other policies that disable stuff when they try to connect. And uh, as a condition, you tell it that it's going to be that port type of wireless, which is what you did in the, in the first thing. And then as an additional condition, you can say, I want to select a Windows group, and only if the device is in this Windows group, let it connect. OK? Now, you can leave that, you can leave that out, or uh, you can put it in. So if you put it in, you can have laptops that are allowed to use this SSID, and then a whole group of uh, laptops in your company that, that aren't. That's up to you. It is one extra thing that you have to remember. When you get a new laptop and you want it to be able to connect to that SSID, you've got to throw it in that uh, Windows group. And I, and I say Windows group, it's not an Active Directory OU. In fact, I couldn't find a way to let, it, uh, let me select an Active Directory OU. Maybe one of you here <laughs> can, um, but I couldn't, I couldn't find it. Yeah, that, that's OK. So we have confirmation. Uh, the next tab, the constraints, this is where you go in and you tell it that you're connecting to, uh, um, you're going to use a certificate for authentication. And you pick the certificate. And this is not a third party cert. You don't have to go out and, and buy one. You have to let it generate one and then tell it to use it. And later, you deploy that to all of your workstations through group policy. This is one of those gotchas because that certificate that gets generated, it's typically like a three year certificate, and it does expire. So this is the thing that, like, three years from now, you've got to remember. Oh. And it's easy enough to go and generate a new certificate ahead of time and then push that one out. But if you forget, that day will come. In this case, it's going to be June 8th of 2017. And um, you know the world's going to stop turning. So I threw a slide in here, yes. You've got to go into Active Directory and whatever. If you, if you tell it a, a group that you want to use, you've got to go into AD and then add those machines into that. In this case, I call the group Authorized Wireless. I know, crazy. OK, so now we go over to group policy. And in group policy, what we're going to do is 
tell them that I've got this SSID out there called staff wireless and then push out the um, certificate that they're going to use. Uh, so that's what this slide is here. It's saying, okay, here's the certificate that I want to push out and, um, and do that. And then also earlier is where you pick the SSID name that they're going to connect to. And, uh, and that's what pushes that out. So the really cool thing is with a laptop, you boot it up on, you know, don't join to the domain with a wired connection. As soon as this group policy hits, they're on Wi-Fi. They don't even have to click the little Wi-Fi thing and say, oh, here's an SSID, let me pick it and connect. It's on. So it makes it really easy to to play. The other, the other like, place where you'd want to use this, like I was talking to an uh, administrator of a school network the other day, and he was like, oh, yeah, you know, is there's a couple of screwy apps, and I have to make the teacher the admin of the laptop to be able to run it and stuff. And as soon as that happens, they can go in and click the WPA2 and see the password for Wi-Fi. And then as soon as one person has it, then everybody has it. And then I got all these devices on the secure network that shouldn't be on there. Well, with this, they can hit that SSID, even with they're connected, even if they're admin their machine, there is no password. It's, here it is, your machine's part of that group, and it has a certificate or not. So it puts you back in total control. Now, the sonic wall, uh, I, th I threw this in there because uh, once you do the, uh, actually, I should, uh, should back up. In the uh, Ubiquity, in the controller, you can say, okay, this SSID is going to get dropped onto this VLAN. And typically for the enterprise one, you're just going to let it go to the default VLAN because that's your normal network. Um, and then you'll set up another guest uh, VLAN for your guest Wi-Fi. And it's like the second drop down that you've got to go through. You've got to select hey, I want the computer store for the certificates. And I'm pretty sure when you add this, uh, that role um, that it then uh, generates the one for that, that server. And then from there, you're able to pull it out and push it into your group policy. And do you run all these services on a single server, or do you have a different server for each of these different services? Um, so you've got... DHCP, NPS, and um, yeah, those are the, oh, and then group policy. Certificate services. Yeah, certificate services. So I suppose you, yeah, I don't see I'm a reason. I'm just curious on your individual situation. I mean, yeah, obviously mine I had, this. yeah, mine I had a bunch of them. Um, and the, the actual uh, NPS server, it's called license because I was, I had a licensed server and I'm like, well, it's not really licensing, but close enough, and the role fits, and the server isn't doing much else. So that was the that was the way I did it on that one. Uh, but I don't see any I don't see anything that would conflict that would keep you from running it on the same server. I don't know. Or I was going to ask Dustin if um, what he did, but. I yeah. So yeah. So you could do it like that. Anybody else? All right. Thank you all, and uh, we've got a little bit of a break before our next one. <laughs>